right, cool, cool. All right, I think we can get started. Yeah, let's jump right in. This is a important topic. A lot of people have been asking us about, so uh, I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, welcome everyone. So welcome to the Happy Conversation, a multifamily thought leadership series by Happy Co. Uh, today, we're gonna be discussing Beyond the Buzz, making AI work for you. And the whole premise is there's been a lot of conversation and chatter about ChatGBT, Google Bard, DALI, uh, all this you know, buzzwords that are coming out. But it's really interesting that generative AI has been around since the 80s. Uh, you know, we've, we've had people in, in the military of all places using stuff like deep learning to experiment with really crazy stuff around artificial neural networks. There's a lot of buzzwords going around. We're going to demystify it. Um, so what we're going to try to explore today is why what is it with this buzz and how can we really apply some of these ideas and concepts to the multifamily industry um so today we have uh, casey berman from Canberra creek casey do you want to introduce yourself sure casey berman i'm the founder and managing partner at Canberra creek we're a real estate focused venture capital firm we've been investing in real estate related technology companies since 2011 before Prop tech was even a term. And uh, today we work with over 300 strategic real estate groups that have invested into our various funds to identify the best companies in the world, to invest in the best companies, and then help them become the market leaders in their space. So thank you for having me. We're excited to uh, talk about AI. Yeah. Um and I think today's it's going to be a much more of a free flowing conversation. Uh, it's not a typical webinar where I pepper you with a million questions, because um, I think we're all trying to learn together at the same time, um, which is a really interesting world. Um, one of the things maybe to maybe kick it off is what is AI? Like you, you've, you've done a bunch of presentations now, which I thought were really interesting. Yeah. Can you summarize what AI is? And yeah, yeah. That's what that is. I think that's an important piece. And one of the things that we think about when we get asked the question from real estate folks is, you know, what is it? And then the second question is, should we be excited or should we be afraid? We'll dig into both. So artificial intelligence, AI is the development of a computer system that can perform tasks that typically require human intelligence. So the way to think about that is if you traditionally thought a human intelligence was required to solve a specific problem, the idea behind AI is that a computer system could do it. Now, one of the pieces of AI is called machine learning. This is often used interchangeably, uh, but is actually a piece of artificial intelligence. And machine learning is a subset of AI whereby the tool continuously collects information that will further refine the system's ability to make decisions with the additional information. So the idea is that it's continuously, continuously improving and getting better at making decisions with more information. And very much like a human, uh, when you watch a young child learn how to walk, they try to walk, they fall a lot, uh, and they get better and better by practicing. So one of the things that we've seen in the past, you know, Boston Dynamics makes these great videos of their robots learning to walk, distilling the information and getting better and better at walking. Uh, so then with that, I think it's also important to make the distinction that people often confuse AI with just workflow efficiency. So AI and machine learning tools are different than just workflow efficiency, but they can be applied to make workflows more efficient. Very interesting. Okay. How's that? Do you get yeah. it? Everyone's yeah. got it now. That, that, that is good. It, it's, um, it's interesting, right? Because when I was working in the video gaming industry, uh, right. AI was just part of the norm because, you, you know, if you, if you think about any video game, you have these like bad characters or NPCs, we call them, on on screen, and they're they're trying to kill the, you know, your character, and like that in itself is like some kind of AI. Is is it different yeah. from what you're describing, or is generative AI different than that? Yeah. So one of 
one of the ones that I generative AI is different. One of the ones, the examples in gaming that I love the most is just any sports game, Madden or NHL, any of these games where you select the level of the opponent. And the idea behind that for years has always been, if it's too hard, you don't want to play. So you have different levels of opponent to match your level. And how do you make a better opponent in the gaming world? How can you make a better opponent? The opponent has to learn to be a better player. Yeah. Um, so that's a great example. I, the gaming industry is one of the furthest along in terms of applying uh, machine learning, generative AI, and artificial intelligence. And the idea, let's hit on generative AI, is to use a specific prompt to actually generate either a picture, to generate text uh, that's relevant to the specific prompt. And that's the key. So you take a large subset of data, you take a large amount of data, you provide a prompt, and then yep. with that prompt, the generative AI can actually fill in, in the case of a picture, uh, what something may look like using that prompt. I think Adobe Firefly has one of the most uh, exciting demos floating around the internet right now, where they show you how fast you can edit or modify a picture using generative AI. Uh, and that, that's a fun tool to check out. And, and, and can, to explain the Adobe Firefly to essentially you're editing a photo and you can kind of select an area. Uh, let's yeah. say you can select uh, my background right here, right? And then you can say, fill it in with, I don't know, like a carnival or something. And it will kind of just automatically generate that. Is that what it is? That's right. That's exactly right. Um, and, and to be very specific, you can do things very specific, like I want to be in a glacier scene. And then not only is it a generative picture, but you can actually be in a video totally generated using their database of video. Um, so the, the implications are massive for the movie industry, for the uh, gaming world, where the creation was a lot of the challenge. Yeah. Uh, now that that creation can happen almost instantly. Wow. We'll get to some like examples later on because I think there's something there. But um, maybe the next question I have is uh, to explore is AI sounds really scary, right? Like yeah. Yeah, Terminator. Like, uh, are we all robot? Gonna... Right. You, I'm sure you've <laughs> yeah. seen that movie. Yeah, Wally. Um, well, yeah. Well, um, but, like, should, we, should we be afraid of it? Like, what? What do you? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So I'll I'll start with the conclusion. I think we need to be both. Uh, smart and afraid, but at the same time excited. And uh, this past spring, there was a news article, and an example, the United States Air Force Chief of AI Tests and Operations, Colonel Tucker Hamilton, uh, gave uh, a quote, this is just like perfect movie, where a, they were testing an AI tool on a weapon system, where the weapon system was going to target and destroy a target. That was what it was trained, that was what it was programmed to do. And in between targeting and destroying the target, there was a human operator that would say yes or no. In the first iteration, the target found, or the uh, weapon system found the target, the human operator said, no, do not destroy it. And the simulation was over. In the second iteration, the weapon system found the target. The human said, no, don't destroy it. The weapon system destroyed the human and then destroyed the target. Uh, they changed the programming to say, do not destroy the human. The third iteration was the weapon system found the target, destroyed the communication channel that the human had with the weapon system, yeah. and then destroyed the target. So. Either way, it was quite concerning that the human was taken out of the equation by the weapon system in two out of the three simulations. And just like a fantastic movie, uh, within the week, the quote was taken back, the story was denied, 
mm -hmm. and we are all left guessing. Uh, whether that's true or not doesn't really matter. It does illustrate how a artificial intelligence is not a human. Yeah. It is just the information, a collection of information and the programming and parameters given by humans, and then it is run. So while humans to some degree can be predictable, uh, AI quite regularly will not be predictable. Yeah. My favorite, uh, this is a good one. My favorite picture is if you, for the beginning generative AI, you'd ask the pick the system to create a picture of salmon swimming up a stream. Uh, and the, uh, Jindo, have you seen the picture of this one? Have you seen the, there's a picture of what looks like sushi salmon swimming oh. up a stream. And it's just the most amazing, <laughs> like, miss of generative AI. Yeah. Every time I see it, I crack up. Yeah, it's so funny. Um, yeah, the, um, there's like so many, uh, I don't know if you've played with any of the, the mid journey AI stuff where you can generate images and for a long time even today like ai has a lot of challenges trying to draw human fingers <laughs> and it's yeah, like, stuff like that i like yeah it's such a weird i don't know just a weird thing but it's getting better it, it draws four yeah. fingers that are joined instead of <laughs> like a whole it's so good to see the uh mistakes that a computer will make um, yeah. Um, before we jump into some multifamily examples, I wanted to to really see if we can come up with some interesting ideas or use cases of AI. Have you seen anything outside of multifamily that you went, wow, that's pretty cool. Like that, that's a great use of AI. Yeah, I mean, I, my favorite is in the medical space. I love mm -hmm. any, any of the repetitive medical uh, analysis yeah. Using AI tools seems amazing. Are there specific ones that you've seen or that really shocked you? Yeah, there, there was one, um, there was one study where, uh, talking about like machine learning, they, uh, they, they, they fed the AI, you know, thousands of cases of like, I think it's like detecting cancer mm -hmm. and, um, the AI got so good that it was able to detect cancer like basically from one pixel and and so what happened was you know like for example um, the AI said hey this 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 patient has cancer and then the doctor's like no I can't see it right and and so the doctor's like no this is not this is not right there's some abnormality and then like three or four months later on the, oh, the man. patient actually developed cancer and and so they went holy cow like we're able like this AI was able to find the one pixel and predict cancer in I think ninety plus percent um, of, of the of the um, of the sample that they were they were fed. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just things, it's things like that are just so exciting, right? It's it's mm -hmm. uh, such precision and accuracy is incredibly important, in, especially in medicine. Uh, yeah. So that's exciting. Yeah, I think that there um, there's a bunch of them which. You can you can feed melanoma uh, detect early stages of melanoma by taking mm -hmm. photos of your skin and then kind of like figure it out as well. So, yeah, I'm I'm really excited about the the medical field. Um, <laughs> it's like yeah, I mean, it's it's changing the world for the for the better. So yeah, I, I think those will change our really society for the better. Yeah. In the moment, I think it's been incredibly fun, and even within our own organization like change the culture of just using some of the tools for fun. So yeah. like the generative image solutions, uh, you know, one of the things that we've talked about is just making funny images as a company. Yeah. And to some degree, when we talk to our investors, there's almost like a fear. So just getting people access, getting people comfortable with something new is really important so that, that that's been really fun internally at our at camera creek yeah we, we've been able to um so I, I tested a bunch of different things over the last six months uh, one of the things i i played around with was uh basically creating a digital avatar of myself <laughs> and, 
so you know you kind of record. I think like, your debut is coming up. We. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I'm actually no. doing it right now, but uh, uh, but but it was really cool. And you can, and, but the cool thing is, like, so you record yourself, and it creates a, a digital you, and you you can kind of feed it scripts, right? So you copy and paste text, and it kind of like speaks. It doesn't have a lot of emotion yet, which is kind of like me, I yeah. guess. But um, it, it it it's it's able to have to like speak in different languages as well. So um, I can change use my voice in English, or I can change it to like someone that with a, a mix. This is, this is how good it gets. So you can change it to a Spanish speaker. You can wow. choose Mexican Spanish, you know, Colombian, like Spain Spanish, right? And it has like different tonations. Um, but that's really cool for like a learning, you know, if you wanted to, to yeah. teach people that stuff. But, but I was thinking it more from like a long, uh, if, if, you know, if I die, touch wood, um, my, my son can go onto this thing and just like, you know, play his dad talking i'm like oh it's really cool like you know just little weird things like that again another thing we've seen in the movie like that's right out of a movie script. son you, you are a disappointment of, yeah. you know, and, <laughs> and um, not only hear it but feel it from your face come yeah, out exactly <laughs> well, i feel like we have uh we i'm excited to see the gendo avatar linkedin debut sometime in the near future and that'll be awesome uh, yeah it's, it, it, yeah, it has some creepy bits to it, but um, <laughs> it, it, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's like the Tom Cruise deep fake. I mean, that one yes. was pretty wild. That floated around the internet for a while. Yeah, there's a ton of, like the Joe Biden one. So I don't. Yeah. Know. So it's uh, pretty scary about yeah. ident identity theft could be a really big thing, right? If it has your voice, your your avatar. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. We. Um, uh, I gotta throw a shout out to Notarize with their identity solution, so that. In order to prevent people from making deep fakes to do things, you got to work with great identity companies like Notarize. Well, um, do, what, what do they do? So, I mean, they're the largest digital notarization platform in the country, but they have a product called Proof, right. where uh, not only notarization, but proving your identity, right? What's the next phase of digital identity? And it's just, it's beyond a digital signature. It's beyond just... A video chat you got to do more than that because to your point you could do a deep fake yeah well um is there are there any other examples you can think of outside of the industry before we jump into in this multi-family ideas yeah i mean i think the movie gaming is probably the largest and the most advanced so going back to like ai and generative solutions there's been a number and this is you you said it already it's been going on for decades the biggest jump we've seen now is just the public access to the tools for free. Yeah. It's crazy. Where we've already seen it implemented the furthest along are the groups who had built their own internal, own internal solutions like the gaming companies, the movie sector with CGI, you know, the, uh, the Marvel universe, this is just unbelievable. Yeah. Isn't, uh, doesn't mostly exist. I mean, most are like, that seems pretty obvious, but a lot of that is generative, generative in uh, how they've created it. The um, the one that sort of just came to mind was recently, I don't know if it's Google or someone, they had this demonstration where uh, the AI was, it, it's a, I think it's like a speech AI, and the AI was trying to book a hair appointment or something. I don't know if it was an answer or booking a hair appointment. And it basically rang, it, you know, basically it was said, hey, go find the best hairdresser, for example, in this in my area and book in a hair, hair appointment. And what it did was it looked at the person's calendar and then it, it rang, um, you know, rang the hairdresser and, and it basically was talking to the hairdresser and saying, hey, do you want to book an appointment? Can you book, can I book for this date, this time? This is my name. And the person yeah. so they successfully booked it, uh, faking to be a person on the phone. That was pretty crazy. The question is, what did the AI's hair look like after the appointment? <laughs> it was very pixelated. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't, there was no API to the generative AI tool for the picture. No, the no. fingers were like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Let, let, let's jump into some like multifamily ideas. And, and for this segment, maybe um, like more specific and, and creative and specific, the better. Because I don't want to go, oh, chatbots are like 
all right, <laughs> like, what do you mean? Um, yeah. I want to be able to kind of share some ideas on like how AI can really help help the in the industry. Um, yeah. Yeah. Any ideas? What yeah. So we, we've bucketed it there. You could bucket it however you want. The way we think about it is there's workflow automation, automating tools that may or may not actually be, be, be based on AI, but yep. the AI tools will add the ability to com for complexity. So like to your point, there's always been calendaring, not always, there's been calendar solutions for a long time, yeah. uh, but to actually tie into your calendar and then potentially search Google for not only a hair place, but factor in the rating of the hair places, the proximity of the hair places, and then taking a step further and calling, you know, there's, there's, there's complexity and that's where the AI tool becomes more and more valuable. Yeah. So what we're thinking about it or the way we bucketed it is workflow automation, communication tools. So chatbots, and then the business intelligence. So people have used, used business intelligence for a long time, but the idea of tying disparate data pieces to make informed decisions, often making decisions along the way to bubble up the most relevant stuff. So those are the three that we think about. I think if you want, we can unpack uh, all of them. Let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's do that. All right. Um, you want I, mean, to do so I, I flipped the question on you. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the ways you guys are thinking about workflow automation and beyond just like the simple, yeah. like how do you get, how do you make things more efficient that are people would generally think are complex? Yeah. So I like, I have a slightly different view or take on it. Um, I actually like to do the simple, simple stuff, you know, and, and, and it's crazy because everyone's like thinking, Oh, how, how does AI do the big stuff? And yeah. I always think about like, how do you, how does AI do the tiny thing really well and, and, and get rid of like, it, it, it's crazy. Like, um, and this is back to my, you know, graphic design, video gaming world where you spend a lot of time on like user psychographics, emo people's emotional state when they're using interfaces. And, and it's crazy. Like, um, if someone is doing something that they don't like doing, it actually feels 10 times longer than something yeah. they like doing. Right. So, um, for example, we have an, our CapEx product, uh, the team recently built a feature where you could take a photo of an invoice and it would automatically take, grab all the details on a physical printout and populate the, uh, digitally, the CapEx, you know, Invoice. But I really like inputting each line item one at a time <laughs> on all of the different systems that I have. Yeah. Why? Why? why, why yeah. Well, and you know, I, I like doing that because then I don't have to do the physical work. <laughs> I can just enter stuff in. But imagine, um, you know, because we went around look, talking to our customers and we talk, spoke to this one technician and he's like, uh, you know, I have to input these invoices and he pulled out this uh, I don't know, like, probably like maybe 20 or 30 invoices from Home Depot because he had been a bunch of different times. And he was like, so I have, I'm going to manually enter these 20 invoices. And we watched him do it. Um, he was inputting into an existing uh, ERP PMS system. And it took him three to maybe five minutes per invoice of just manually because he had to, you know, it was really small. So he had to kind of go back and forth, edit, put stuff in. And so we've been able to create like a way you take a photo, it automatically populates. Um, yeah. And then, then you can kind of like look through, is it correct and press okay. Um, so that's what one area that we've been playing around with. Um, that's on workflow. The other one is trans uh, language translation is a really good one. Yeah. Uh, so in our app now, when you're, when you're sort of taking a photo of an inspection, you can use English to Spanish or Spanish to English translation, and, and so if you're if you're a Spanish speaker, you can you can sort of you know say that you know the the, the walls have stains and need to repaint them in, in Spanish. Type that in Spanish, it automatically translates to an, to English. Um, again, that's not like something crazy new, but it, you know, we're, we're leveraging a lot of the the AI out there that can kind of figure out the context of the language. So those are two very easy wins that we've added recently. Yeah, those save normal people lots of time. You know, it's like the, seems so obvious when you say it, but that's uh, incredibly efficient. Um, like one, one of the ones, 
that I've really enjoyed looking at, it's almost like the visual visualization stuff. Yeah. Was the uh, solutions that automate test fits. So think for like a development site or yep. uh, for in the commercial space, tenant improvement work based on, you know, for a retailer, if you have a hundred locations, you can have all hundred locations and the fit and efficiency of those locations. And then every time you input a new location, uh, the system can optimize the layout. Yep. Or in the case of like developing or building a new multifamily asset, what are the restrictions? Is it going to be stick built? Can it be high rise? You can run both the analysis and feasibility instantly. Yeah, That's very exciting and compelling. So instead of that taking a long time being a process, you can optimize the feasibility of projects. Uh, so stuff like that, I find really cool. If you kind of follow the timeline of an asset, so from you know acquisition, then you operate it yourself, but maybe on the acquisition side, have you seen anything or can you think of anything along those same lines as what you just mentioned? Uh, but have you seen anything that can kind of help, you know, owners buy things faster, make better decisions? Quicker? Yeah. What, 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 what have you seen? Great question. So I feel quite strongly if you have the silver bullet of acquisitions, I have a tool yeah. and a software that will enable me to buy better than everybody else. If I had that, I would not sell that tool. I'd buy the assets. I'd <laughs> use the tool to yeah. buy the real estate. Yeah. And it's through that lens, I think in the past, a number of startups have promised the world. Yeah. Our tool is better, faster. It's going to enable your team to buy things that you've never been able to buy before. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a miscommunication of expectations. So yes, there are absolutely tools that will enable acquisitions teams, uh, to do their work more efficiently. But I think to date, there's been a couple of false starts with companies promising the world and then selling their solutions. And really it's just a, a piece of the workflow. So I'll give you an example, not of the, uh, false starts. Uh, but there's a number of data companies in the country, companies like Placer AI, like Unicast, uh, that provide both migration and location data yeah. that you can then integrate as part of your acquisitions team to optimize and prioritize more efficiently. So, you know, if you have 50 locations, uh, maybe you look at 500 locations. And you can use a software to uh, prioritize the top 10. Right. So we're a team, like the idea is team of four previously looked at 50. Now a team of four can look at 500 and still narrow it down to 10 in the same amount of time. There's value in that. Uh, you'll have, ultimately make better acquisitions. And there are solutions that'll help you with that today. Yeah. Interesting. Do, do you think that? The, is there something out there that doesn't exist, which you think should exist on that, on that front? Yes, there are, uh, the way we think about it, there, there are tools that do pieces of that. Yeah. Uh, what we're actually exploring right now. And one of the themes that we have is this concept of a flexible tool. So like one, one of our actually portfolio companies called Keyway has created a pretty interesting tool to be applied to acquisition strategies to then help optimize the acquisition. And what you apply it to is flexible. So the idea is collect large amounts of data, optimize the traditionally paper or human pieces. So collecting the rent rolls, standardizing the rent rolls, uh, collecting the data relevant to the rent rolls, comparing the local data and the rent rolls to the actual value of the assets to then come up with an archetype of what is optimized. Great. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you have something that's optimized, find more of it. Yeah. That's a really uh, cool. And that's traditionally been done with humans 
And I think what we will start to see over the next really three to five years is a lot more automation. So no, there's no silver bullet, yeah. uh, but a lot of automation to get you a lot further with a lot more data and a lot, a lot more acquisition targets. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a really, that's a really cool idea. Um, following that thread, if you kind of look at the rent roll, I know this is a very specific use case. There's so yeah. many promises of like companies that have come out, they, they take rent rolls, ingest them, they clean them up a lot. Have you seen anything that works really, really well? And if not, what, what, what's the gap there? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so we, we invested in a company formerly known as uh, red IQ. Yep. Uh, now it's owned by uh, Bercadia where that was their entire thesis where they would standardize the massive disparity between rent rolls, clean them up so that, uh, similar to the office space, you could run your uh, Argus model, right? Like an Argus, that's a pretty standard methodology in commercial. Yeah, yeah. And the challenge with standardization is you need industry-wide buy-in. And that's where the biggest challenge is for this space. Where AI can solve, to your question, solve the problem is you don't have to have the standardization because the complexity can be standardized by AI. Are there, I mean, are there, I'll flip it back on you. Are there things uh, or ways you're thinking about the rent roll that could be done? Yeah. Yeah. Cause we, we have a tool for due diligence. And so we process thousands and thousands of DDs a year, right? acquisitions uh, across the country a, a year. And we've been trying to find one of the biggest challenges is someone going from one PMS to another PMS exporting yeah. role. And to do it, they're never the acquisition is never same PMS to same PMS. That it's yep. a prerequisite in multi that if you buy an asset, you have to be a buyer from a different PMS. Yeah, <laughs> yeah for sure. Oh, you're yeah. using the same one? No, and you have to use a different version of the same. Uh, <laughs> At model. the very least, a different version. <laughs> uh, but but to your point, like you, you kind of the challenge is mapping the GL. One of the challenges is mapping the GL codes, right? So if you have, I don't know, like. Uh, some kind of capital expense, it needs to be mapped across di directly one for one. Yeah. But sometimes it isn't. But um, we've been using, uh, I guess, chat GPT and all that kind of stuff to kind of figure out like uh, open AI to go, all right, he here's a list of GL codes. Here's another list of GL codes. Try to map them yourselves. <laughs> Try to figure out what they kind of mean. And, and it gives me like a 80 to 90 percent accuracy with, with with an untrained um you know chat gpt is like open as like untrained for multifamily to some degree um but but i think yeah 80 to 90 percent and then if you can map that then there's an additional 10 fields that you kind of manually go da, 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 like that yeah something the, the challenge is you, you the industry needs accuracy yeah you know that that 80 to 90 percent not good enough well, yeah, well, we'll immediately create questions about the whole due diligence, unless it can be solved before the product is, you know, unless the, again expectations can be managed well. But but I, but I always think about it as like again that that whole like just what's the next step, right? Like if you can click a button, it maps eighty to ninety percent, but it shows yeah. you the list of like what it will be, then you can yeah. physically move things around and then yeah it'll show you the disparity that's great because you, you add the level of transparency you know like that yeah. that's where you almost can you have the un, like accept button undo button yep custom button you know like that level of it's almost like there's a period of time where the trust in the automation needs to be built yeah at least in multifamily and some of the other industries the trust already is there uh but that's a that's an important process that and that goes to like changing the culture, which I think but, is but isn't, isn't that like, um, but just by the act of remapping and, and confirming what the mapping is, isn't that partly training the AI models as well to kind of get well, that? I think it's training the human and training the AI models. Because <laughs> a lot of times, like people just don't the guessing as well, right? Like uh, yeah, I I think a lot of stuff is miscategorized and mispaid. Yeah. Uh, I think in any acquisition, if you talk to any acquisitions team, they would say every single time there's a significant amount of CapEx or potentially 
uh, not CapEx that was categorized CapEx for the benefit of the seller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. To your exact, maybe it's on purpose. Maybe it's a total yeah. accident. We're not going to point any fingers. Uh, but like how things are categorized, I think can be strategic. Yeah. All right. Um, let's move along now. So you have the rent roll. Now, like it's part, now you got the property, you own it. You got to create like a, a CapEx renovation, kind, some kind of like, what do I do with the asset? Like, what, what have you seen yeah. there? Anything exciting? Anything? Yeah. So construction actually has a surprising amount of automation that has been developed. Mm -hmm. So companies that uh, do takeoffs, automated takeoffs, automated spec books, uh, I didn't like, uh, object recognition solutions. Yep. They have not been applied directly at scale to multifamily. There's been a few companies, uh, that are doing various tools in the space. So, uh, Conwise is a company that's doing software for bidding and cost estimation using yep. an algorithm. There's uh, Modulize out of Norway, uh, which is more for con like construction and manufacture pre-manufactured stuff to do automated takeoffs. Uh, there's a whole industry of, I'd argue, automation and simplification with design and build from raw to just turns. Yeah. Then, I mean, the simplest, there's companies that just do turns. Uh, yep. There's a debate whether or not that's real tech or not. Yeah. Uh, but that that's the type of thing where with time and efficiency, the turn for a multifamily unit isn't that complex. Yeah. And the repeatability and commonality of buy a real estate building, buy a multifamily apartment, update the units, optimize rent to market. That's the most common acquisition strategy, at least presented in multifamily acquisition decks. Uh, so I, we, we expect there to be more. And I, I mean, I'd love to hear about Happy Co. You guys are intimately involved in that operations process. What, Jendo, what are you guys working on? Yeah, so we haven't really dove too deep into the AI world on that piece yet. Like, the, you know, obviously, once you finish your due diligence, there's a uh, right. we have a feature where you can click a button and then you basically build out the business plan. You go, hey, show me all of the uh, countertops that need replacing. Show me all of the, the units that have flooring that needs replacing. And then based yeah. on that, you can kind of create like the scope of work for every, like a very high level asset manager view of like, this is, you need to spend... Fifty thousand dollars, you know, across these ten units, and ten thousand across these like two units, whatever it is, right? And then you kind of build, build that out. Um, one thing that I really was interested in, or I thought was a good application of visual AI. Um, it, I think there's a company called Taylorbird out there. I don't know if you've seen those guys, um, but essentially what you do is you take a photo of, say, the kitchen, and it kind of works out the dimensions of the kitchen or in, in that space using visual learning. And through through that, then you kind of create like a scope of work and then you then send it out to bid to, to three contractors kind of bid, bid on it. I think that's a really cool idea. I, I, I don't know how accurate the measurement is or how yeah. like 98%. And as you know, 98% doesn't quite cut it in the- No, in it's, the, a, it's a linear algebra problem. That's, it should be- uh... It should be very close. And then, you know, the actual contract or actual work will field measure at the end of the day. So, yeah, close enough. Close enough to get someone in to get you. Yeah. So I think that's a really cool example. Um, what what we're trying to work towards is figure out, and this is less, I guess this, this, this is a little bit of an AI, but really trying to figure out the scope of work needed to get the most bang for buck for your rent. So what that means right. is I'm looking to renovate unit 202 do i put stainless steel countertops do i put um you know what sort of renovation package today and i think that's something that no one really it's a very 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 manual process at best because you have to do market surveys and you kind of look at the actual rents versus the the market you know asking rates um, yeah i think there's something there where you can kind of automate 
that process and, and something that we're, we're trying to yeah figure out. and there, there's a precedent for that our uh, portfolio company Curbio yeah they do pre-sale home remodeling oh. and what they can do is they can take the Matterport scan of a home combine that with the data they have, because they do o over 2000 remodels a year, they can combine that with the data they have on the local market and the value increased of the home by updating one kitchen or one kitchen, a bath, two baths, bedroom. They can actually do like an a la carte analysis of if we add X, Y, or Z, how will it increase the sale value, the ultimate sale value of this home pre-sale? Uh, so it, there is a precedent in single family. How, how uh, this goes to the, the the question of culture later on, but how yeah. have they managed to operationalize this? Because right, yeah. if, if you hold a multifamily operator, hey, we want you guys to go in and use the Matterport, take the, you know, like a 360 right, degree right. view, uh, and then we're going to like run some, yeah, no. we're just like, dude, I just fixed. We're just going to rent it up. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll fill it up. Don't worry about it. So, um, so at Kirby, their whole business model is built around doing a pre-sale remodel. So they are a construction company first. Yeah. Uh, and then their business is built on being the most efficient construction company in the country. Yeah. So how do you get a tech margin with a construction company? You got to automate literally as much of every single piece of the process. So for them culturally on day one when a contractor said i'm going to go to the site four times before i start demolition curbio said how can we solve that problem going zero so to answer the culture question you have to ask the question how do i do it differently first yeah. and then you can solve to add the efficiency if you're not willing to ask the question you're stuck. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and I think that's, I, I would, and we, let, I mean, we could jump to culture, but I, I think that's one of the biggest challenges. I think in multifamily and in a lot of real estate, there's a hesitancy to ask the question, how can I do it differently? It's worked. Yeah. We've made money. We've updated all this, all the units, the units make more per unit based on the update. Like you don't have to ask as nuanced questions how can we do it differently yeah because for for decades it didn't matter yeah you made money either way yeah yeah so maybe like i know we can probably go into the we haven't even touched the operations side <laughs> maybe we can leave that for another day yeah uh, part two of kinds of like examples um i think let, let's we gotta let's have a part two so you invite me back <laughs> yeah i know like uh we, we, there's a lot of uh, interest in this area. So, and, and I think the crazy part is the speed of change in this this area is so fast, right? Like right. six months ago, you no one heard of ChatGPT, and then suddenly everyone everyone's homework looks the same, right? So I think it's a, a very interesting piece. So maybe let's jump to like culture. How how, how can what's going to change yeah. in multifamily, or do people even not need to change? Do people just are they just happy to coast along? Yeah, so I think the first is people, it went from people not talking about it to being in the front page of newspapers, yeah. both print and digital newspapers, uh, you know, print for us real estate folks. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, people immediately start to feel like they're behind. Yeah. And then there's the fear. So I don't know what it is. I don't know how to do it. I haven't tried it. So I'm afraid. So that's the first group of people where the culture needs to shift immediately. Just what we found is lowering the barrier of trying out some sort of artificial intelligence or machine learning something, just messing around with it. So like go to chat GPT or one of the other tools and ask a question or like yeah. write a press release for me getting a new job and see what happens. You know, do something simple, like write a grocery list that's vegetarian. I don't know. Uh, try something out and really just get exposure. Like that's yeah. step one. 
Then the bigger question is culturally, actually, I'll give a good example. I was at a, uh, an LP meeting yeah. uh, where it was a real estate sponsor with a lot of L large LPs and they had three opening paragraphs, the CEO of the company written by chat GPT. Yeah. One with a positive introduction, one with a uh, neutral introduction and one with a bearish economic outlook introduction. Yeah. And it was an amazing conversation starter, you know, like the disparity, the, the similarities of the introduction, but yet the disparities based on just the qualifier of the e economy was really fun and got everyone talking about it. Uh, yeah, just, yeah that, I, I have an upcoming board meeting, which I might use the same technique as well. There Sounds we like go. Uh, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, the second piece is changing the culture within the organization. I mean, we think about it at Canberra Creek and all the groups we talk to, encouraging first the team to try things out. And that's with, uh, again, I think the pictures are really fun to create like generative fill pictures. Yeah. Uh, but using chat GPT, chat, chat GPT all the way down to like the building engineer level, yeah. enabling a building engineer. Interesting five to 10 minutes to say, ask if like, how could I more efficiently change out filters in all the units? Yeah. Maybe it gives a terrible answer. Maybe it gives a great answer, but either way, the building engineer is no longer going to be afraid to ask that question, both within the company, but then also with chat GPT. So, um, so do you kind of find, do you, cause I, I always, um, people always try to, stereotype or genericize things genericize that's what but like they go oh all building technicians don't know technology all marketing people uh, blah, blah, blah. right so is it is it a matter of like finding more forward-thinking individuals within the organization to start trailblazing or is it more like a you guys need to do you know i want you to use chat gpt three times right. in the next week like what, what do you think would be a better right so i think you're asking the best question how do you change the culture within an organization and there's no silver bullet. Everybody, senior management needs to encourage it. The senior leaders need to encourage it. Yeah. The, there needs to be champions within the local properties. There needs to be a champion, like a building engineer who, and it has to be everyone. And the we, what we have found with organizations that have enabled or shifted their culture, the common thread, they encourage and push their team to question and at, to question things, number one, yeah. but then to ask questions at every level and to every level. So instead of, and I'll, I'll give you like the dichotomy, the yeah. counter to that is everybody is expected to know how to do their job and is expected to be able to do it right without question. Yeah. If those are the expectations, whether written, spoken, or unspoken, people are going to be afraid to raise their hand and say, "Hey, I have a question. How could I do this better?" So you like the switch is the silver bullet is switching to enable people to ask the question at every level to every level. How could I do this better? That's a really good question. Try try asking ChatGPT, and then let's talk about it. And now you've changed this. If I don't know the answer, I'm potentially not doing my job. You changed it to the, you know, the alternative. I'm allowed to not know the answers to everything. I'm allowed to ask questions and then I can make it even better. I can help make my organization better. So it, it's not a, a simple answer, but rather culturally enabling people to ask the questions is key. What we found is working with a group like ours or implementing a company like Capico or one of these other tech companies by showing that with leadership, you're like, you really are starting to lead by example. And by doing that, people start to ask Capico questions. They start to ask Camper Creek questions. Yeah. And then it becomes this positive cycle of both first being okay, asking questions, but then second, trying new things. And that's where the real innovation happens. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, and, and I really liked it. And I always struggle with, with this, right? Because I, I like your point because 
a lot of times it's someone's people think about themselves a lot. Oh, this is my job. <laughs> That's going to yeah, be, I, 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 I have to know this. Yeah. So it's a, like, I think, I don't know if it was Spotify recently, uh, you know, the music streaming service who I think they try they use AI to automate a lot of their customer service. I don't know if you've saw that article, but, but it was crazy. It's, it's basically saying, Hey, I'm, you know, we're, we're going to look to a better tomorrow, but in the short term, we're going to, be happy with a few missing fingers, uh, but guess what? Uh, there's technology that co is a, that's coming to give you artificial robot fingers that makes you stronger. Close better. enough. Those it's the, really uh, the hot dog fingers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always go back to fingers. Of AI. Um, yeah. What 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 else? Any any, any final thoughts on on AI and, and yeah? I mean, that one these these are the questions we like that we get asked. Yeah. Every week by one of our LPs. Uh, it's two questions. Okay. What are we trying to solve and how do we identify value? Yeah. Like, so AI, like, what are we trying to solve? If you don't ask that question, you'll never solve the problems. Like very specifically, what are we trying to solve and what is the value of solving that? So like, I loved your invoice idea. Mm -hmm. Our team spends hours and hours with invoices. How do we make that more efficient and have fewer errors? Great. That's a specific problem you can solve and you can identify the value. You probably overpaid an invoice Well, yeah. you're not going to have that problem again if you use an AI solution. Yeah. Um, and then the second one is how do you use the resources within the company and technology to optimize the solution? So the way we think about that is like nobody wants to hire more people, especially yeah. right now. Yeah. So you have a team. And how do you more efficiently use those resources? The way we think about that comes down to culture. First, you identify the problem you want to solve. You identify the value. And then you look to the specific team and encourage them to find it, right? If the manager of the people putting in the invoices recognizes this problem, they are best suited to work with you, Jendo, and your team to say, wow, this invoice solution does exactly what these three team members need. Yeah. Um, so it, it's creating that culture of innovation. Um, I think that's an incre incredibly important piece for all the people we've seen. Final question for you. This is a this is a very pointed question. Actually, I don't know if it is pointed, but I guess it is pointed. So, <laughs> like, it's re again really hard to change culture, right? If yeah. you kind of Okay, assuming you can map out every single process in a multifamily transaction from acquisition, operating it to selling it. And you could figure out all the potential ways technology, AI process that could kind of solve and streamline things. Is it better to start a company from scratch <laughs> to hire the right people? Or is it easier to just like, you know, try to change the culture over time, knowing that you're just going to but up against resistance or every step along the way. What what would what would work better? <laughs> am I the one creating the software or am I the one with the real estate assets? Real estate assets. Yeah. Uh, that one for me that one is just so clear. You absolutely do not start over. Um okay. a massive portion of real estate is managing to the status quo. Yeah. If you just stay in business and continue to operate over time, over decades, that real estate value will increase, yep. at least has in the last 200 years in the United States. Uh, where there's a massive opportunity, though, is, is going back, changing the culture. Yes, it could appreciate, yes. If you hold on to it and you manage it at the baseline of quality, you'll be fine. Yeah. Assuming you're not totally upside down with interest rates going up so much in the past 12 months, ignoring all that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then with technology, the upside is massive. The amount of the yield could go up to your point around like optimizing rent and rent rolls. We didn't even talk about uh, optimizing rent. Yeah. Uh, uh, episode two. That's episode two. Episode two. We're perfect. Ah, oh, yes, I'm back. <laughs> um, so absolutely, it would be about changing the culture. And to that point, 
there's never a hundred percent culture of innovation. Even the most innovative, our investors who are the most innovative, there are always roadblocks. Yeah. There are always people who are less innovative and that's okay. It's a check on just runaway challenges, which is like, okay, let's try something new every week. That's a waste. Yeah. They're going to burn through resources and not be as productive. So even with innovation, the most innovative companies we work with, there's a balance. Uh, there's a balance there. Okay. All right. On that note, this was a really good discussion. I, I, I learned quite a bit of things during this <laughs> short conversation. Um, I know like for the, for the viewers, uh, if you have comments, ideas, questions, please add them. And uh, Casey and I post uh, later on, we'll try to respond to every single question. But uh, Casey, thank you so much for joining this uh, little discussion. This is super helpful and uh, I can't wait to do episode two. Yeah, Jendo, thank you. This is really fun and it's always, always fun to talk about these things with you, especially. It's always a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. All right. Thank you. Take care.